Anyway, let's let's move on to marketing and the marketing network. Thank you all for joining. Um, we have with us today Matthew Sawyer, who's a member, of course. Um, but he's going to uh, he pinged me yesterday uh, since we had an open slot uh, and offered to tell us a bit about his new book, which came out. Congratulations, De December first. I think that was he hit his uh, his target as far as I understand. Although I don't know how many times the target might have changed. Um, he can tell us more about that, but I think he wants to share a, a bit about uh, the book and uh, what it's all about and a case study. Um, so you, um, uh, Matthew, you can take the control of the screen. Um, we'll do 15 minutes. Uh, I'll let you know <coughs> when we're at about. How do you want to do it? Do you want people to interject with questions? How do you want to handle it? Oh, no, definitely. Definitely. Okay. So, okay, so feel free yeah. to interject with questions at any time um, via either the chat or I think it's okay if you just sort of raise your hand or or uh, yeah. well, blurt first, out or whatever. Yeah, yeah well, thank Take you it away. so much. Yeah, thank you so much. So I've um, been spending, a, as Michael said, the my book came out in uh, December, so I've been trying to get out and to talk to as many people as possible and you know, the, the, the drill and trying to drum up some publicity and some book sales. Um, so uh, I really uh, appreciate you um, taking the time. Let me uh, tell you a little bit about um, what I've been up to, because I think that that's, you know, in terms of the group. So the book is called uh, Make It in America, How International Companies uh, Can um, Companies and entrepreneurs can successfully enter and scale in U.S. markets. And as Michael said, it was um, released in, in December. And the process was, is that what I did was, is that it happened right at um, the start of COVID. I typically was do consulting work and teaching and my consulting work all dried up and um, they cut me back in terms of teaching. So, um, uh, so this was my COVID project. I started um, in... Uh, 2021, um, and it took me about uh, a year to uh, to finally get it off and uh, and and uh, published. Um, so I interviewed over 120 people in 40 countries and business leaders, and um, I know that Michael was helpful in terms of uh, making some connections and so and using this group. Which um, so this is an opportunity for me to kind of pay back a little bit. So what the book covers, it covers topics that um, people would want to if they're coming in. You know, the first thing is, is, well, why would someone want to come to the U.S.? So it goes through in terms of the strongest economy and all of the reasons for doing it, some strategic planning tools, talks about how to formulate a business, financing goes into financing, establishing market presence, um, and then legal and immigration issues. And then it also has checklists, readiness checklists for both entrepreneurs and companies. And there's also a checklist in terms of for legal um, to, uh, to make sure that companies are properly set up as they try to expand here. Um, and one of the, the things that I found the most uh, fun to write um, is, is that in the book, after each chapter, there's a case study. And so I've got companies from Australia, from all over the world um, that are part of it. And each one of them has a case study. And then from that, there's a little bit of lessons to be learned. So what I thought would might be kind of fun and, you know, I'll, I'll stop here in terms of if there's any questions, but what I thought might be is, is that just to share with you one of the case studies, and uh, that might be sort of a good, um, you know, <laughs> um, <laughs> good information for you and maybe some thought starters as well. Unless there are any questions that, that anyone has right now? So you're a marketing consultant. How did you come to uh, focus on sort of uh, the broader uh, <laughs> issue or, or topic of, uh, you know, starting a business in America or importing uh, your business uh yeah into, well i had yeah so i helped a, a bunch of companies um come here i also teach i teach at columbia and at nyu um but i had helped um uh, several companies come to the u.s and you know 
underestimate the complexity, they underestimate the difficulty, um, and uh, we help them in terms of market intelligence um, and establishing a market presence here. And it was from that, and then I also did some work with some of the accelerators, the Canadian Tech Hub and a couple of other accelerators, and I found that that is sort of a common problem or knowledge in terms of or, or lack of knowledge in terms of you know how do you set up and start a company or expand into the US and there really wasn't any um, books that were written about it um, so I I pitched the, the idea to a publisher and um, they had me put together a proposal and part of it was to see what else was out there and I could only find mm -hmm. one other book um, on this topic, and it was written. It was written in German and then translated to the uh, to English. Uh, so, needless to say, it wasn't a page turner. So, uh, <laughs> so the opportunity was there, and so it was. It's it's a fairly um, you know it, it's it's a niche, but it also has, in addition for just international companies, but really anyone that works with international companies and sort of to understand the issues and the problems that they have. There's a there's a chapter about understanding Americans and the cultural <laughs> aspects of it. Um, so um, yeah, so it has a lot of stuff in there. Great, thanks. Yeah, so this was kind of a fun case study. So this was one about the uh, company that was this, uh, it's called Mank. Mank Fenster Fence, means window in German. Um, and uh, it was a 130 year old company that had been established in Europe and they had sold some products into the United States. Um, and in 2015, they said, well, you know, there's an opportunity here. Let's, you know, expand in a big way. So they did a joint venture with another German company and a logistics company. And then they, they set up a factory here in Chicopee, Massachusetts. I don't know if anyone's familiar with Chicopee. It's in West, Western Massachusetts. Um, and they opened it up in 2015. And they put together this, they, um, they got fi uh, financing. They got over a million dollars from uh, the state of Massachusetts and city and state tax incentives. They received a $5 million uh, bond from the Economic Development Organization in uh, Massachusetts. And, um, you know, they, from that, then they built this factory, they spent um, about $10 million um, putting together this, what they call the factory of the future, which was this state of the art factory. And they won all of these awards in terms of the, the, um the complexity and just in terms of this the the high-tech nature of the factory um but they ran into but before then that they ran into some problems but the people that came over the ceo who was german um came over and he felt that the european market was so far ahead of the us that it was at least 10 years more advanced than the us and so what they were going to do is, is they were going to bring that advanced technology to the United States and <clears throat> the manufacturing, particularly in terms of being energy efficient and the processes in Europe were so much more advanced than they were in the US. So he came here with that idea. Um, but then after two years, um, they ended up closing the factory. And according to one of the investors, Boston Private was one of the big um, investor groups. And they said, well, the sales were just too slow. The factory took too long to set it up. It was more expensive to manufacture and they didn't see any return on their investment. They had, had uh, put in uh, several million dollars and they just you know, said, well, no more, we're not gonna put any more money in. And they ended up closing the factory. So the question that I pose to this group is this sort of, well, well, what do you think went wrong? Does so anyone have any ideas? Um, Victor? Thoughts, uh, if, uh, John, sure. Victor? Yeah, I, I mean, it's most likely they they misread the market. I mean, I think, were you, were you trying to, were you hinting there, Matthew, when you said about, you know, they're trying to bring this advanced technology, you know, they could have been too far ahead of the market. 
if people didn't need it or want it or understand it, uh, okay. it's not going to work. Okay. John? I'll add that. Uh, okay, John, go ahead. You're on mute, by the way, John. So take yourself off mute. I, I was going to say exactly the same thing as one who has developed ideas that were ahead of the market, too far ahead of the market. They were too sophisticated and it's very difficult to understand what the problems that Americans saw here as um, related to advantages. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll add one more thing um, that, you know, they, opened, they started their factory, built their factory in 2015, and their investor pulled out in 2017. Not quite a long-term, you know, perspective on things. These these things don't aren't you know immediate successes. Yeah. Uh, they take some effort and time to to work through and find your niche. Um, I, I think two years is is really short sighted. Greg, what did you you, you look? Like I was you were just gonna... gonna say I work with um, I run marketing campaigns for a, like a custom. Um, garage, custom closet, custom, like everything having to do with your home or modeling. And obviously they do windows and doors with part of that. And he's actually never been busier. Like, so, I mean, I, I feel like, you know, he's got these amazing reviews on Google, uh, on his social media. So I feel like, you know, people installing this, these types of products are, are pretty busy and the market's pretty happy with what we have here. Okay. And they didn't hire you either, right? That was one of the yeah. other mistakes. Yeah. yeah, exactly. That's it. Yeah, I would have had this yeah. all up and running. Keith, did you have something? I, you know, the one thing that struck me, and I don't really have a lot, but if they were trying to sell on to be a better, a better mousetrap, um, and and then went for a kind of a traditional construction kind of distributor model, especially if their distributor was German and didn't understand the market, they weren't able to sell on added value, like maybe it provides more safety or security or, you know, what is the, not because it's better technology, but what does the better technology do to make a homeowner feel um, better? Because if there's yeah. problems, you've got to have a brand that's emotional, not just technically better. Well, that also brings up the whole question of what is better, you know, is right. better, you know, and in his mind, the better was, is that it was more advanced, that it was more, sophisticated but um and you know this is a smart group because you guys i i actually presented this to the german american chamber of commerce and when i um to a group it was uh, german technology startups that were thinking of coming to the us and i presented this to them and then i said what do you think went wrong and it was absolute crickets i didn't hear anything you know it was like <laughs> Maybe that was part of the problem too. But let me show you a little bit. I think you guys are absolutely on track, but let me just give you a little bit more flavor to this. Well, the first thing is, is that European windows are very different than they are in the US. So their main product was is these, what they call these tilt and turn windows. The you tilt, but then it comes into the room. Oh, I saw, I saw advertising for this. Uh, we're I in the United States. For this um you um you know we typically go out casement windows that go out or we have the double hung there is some market for you know these tilt and turn and office buildings and whatever but it's a relatively small part of the market so victor in terms of you know your understanding whereas you know as i said here we have these casements or the double hung the other thing is, is that, you know, energy costs are so much different. And so this was back. And so, you know, it, it, this is at the time. So this was about 2015. So I took it, I took the, the costs from here, but energy costs were half in the US is that they were in Germany and Europe. And so the payback for these ultra energy efficient windows, which cost, you know, more than double um, what the U.S. ones were is, is that it had a much longer payoff because of the energy costs. So here, um, although it's changing, but people are tend to buy more energy efficient, more for the um, uh, less the cost benefit aspect of it, and for other reasons. So, um, and particularly then, the other part the problem was is that they fell down in terms of having the skilled labor. So they put in these sophisticated, computer-aided um, 
manufacturing and, and control systems. And they didn't, in Western Massachusetts, they didn't have the talent there to be able to um, operate it. So it took them a lot of time. They were able to get people, then train them um, and how to use it. But it took them four to six months to be able to get them up to speed. And, you know, that was also just in terms of the, uh, you know, the, the, how they were slow in terms of getting up to market. And, you know, Michael, you're probably right that they pulled the plug too quickly, but um, it, you know, after a couple of years, they still, you know, were operating in the red. So the lessons from this case study is, is that, you know, the needing in terms of investigating the market size, you know, what is truly the market, learning what customers want, um, the importance of the talent pool. Um, and then, you know, as the book goes into is, is that really in terms of, you know, you need to have local experts and advisors in order to, to really, um, you know, be successful here. And it's everywhere from market expert, marketing experts. Um, Greg, they should have hired you on the, 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 the marketing aspect of it, but also legal experts, you know, finance experts, you know, that they really need to um, rely on people in terms of doing that. So those were just some of the, the, uh, stories or the case studies that I, I came from. I'm stop. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, we are at the 15 minute mark. Um, yep. uh, we'll take one question, one more question. We had a couple uh, in the interim, but if anybody wants to make a, add a question or make a comment. Yeah, I, I'll make one. I, um, I worked for a German company uh, at an agency that I worked for early in my career. And the the founder had passed it on to his son and they were trying, they had a better roller on a paper machine and they wanted to sell the better roller. It has full strength and all of this. And what we convinced them to do was tell case studies. And they they started to compete against big, the big manufacturers of the machines and their replacement parts with their specialized roller based on the case studies. And so we had a, we built them a communication strategy. We wrote them a little white paper that explained the difference. We had done the research kind of to your point. And then all we did was write case studies. So the constant flood of information was about people saying how much better their rollers were and how it saved them money and, and um, you know, did all the, the great things that a shop floor manufacturer cared cared about. Yeah, I, yeah, I love case studies too. You know, it's just it's a good way of demonstrating and bringing the concepts. You know, because marketing concepts are, you know, I think you can learn a marketing concept in, you know, the basic concepts in a couple of weeks, but it takes a lifetime to really perfect them. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you for that comment. I'm I'm surprised that Jeff Strauss isn't smiling bigger when we talk about case studies. But, uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and the effectiveness of those case studies. Um, so I dropped in the uh, uh, the chat the order more or less in which people showed up. Um, why don't we take uh, like two and a half minutes each? I think that should give us enough time. Um, and uh, tell us, you know, what's going on. What's uh, uh, obviously, introduce yourself, what you do, how you, uh, what type of marketing services or sales services you provide, what makes you different. And, um, you know, since it's the beginning of the year, anything you've got planned for the new year, any uh, resolutions you might have made, business or otherwise. Um, and uh, I'll set my timer for two minutes. Ken, Simon, then Joan Abraham, then Jeff Strauss. Ken, take it away. And if you, everybody would go on mute, so I will, uh, uh, put it on speaker mode so the the speaker gets full screen hi i'm ken simon uh, i didn't think i was going to be here i had jury duty today and i got out of it so it was a good thing otherwise it was going to be for a month um criminal case so it would, it would have been interesting but anyway and i it, it really enjoyed your your presentation uh I, I i just was wondering i just had one question which was like what uh what markets were you going because i could see that 
book being more relevant to the European market or or outside the United States than here for co for companies that are trying to you know market into the United States. Um, I work. Well, cool. I'll, I'll finish my thing. I have two minutes, so maybe you would, you know, but uh, I work with small and mid-sized companies, helping them understand who their customers are and what their needs are, and then develop the strategies for them to, you know, market their their products or services to their to their companies um, or to their pro to their customers or and you know, help drive sales and leads. And I've been working, I'm working with right now, or I'm starting to work with a, a, a company in the UK that is involved with the space industry. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna be helping them uh, with that, which I'm excited about because I've never worked in this industry before, though I'm very excited about that. Uh, and then, but I also worked with uh, companies in the financial services sector, technology sector, um, and, uh, and recently a lot of startups as well. Um, but that's what I do, uh, you know, and, and I've helped companies like a, a, a company that manufactured a uh, a device that used artificial intelligence to uh, identify birds by their sounds and send that, that to an app. So I, I help them drive their online sales. Uh, and then they're, right now they're doing it in the United States and Canada, but they are going to expand worldwide and they are testing it, but they're not going, they're not they're doing all the development in the United States, but so, so I found your case studies and books very interesting, Matt. And so, it, it, so I, I may look for your book. I don't know how much time I have left, but that's about yeah, it. It was about twenty seconds. So Shazam for birds, and and uh, didn't you also work with the you know, Australian space company? So this is like yeah, but I, I they wanted it for free. I'm not. I don't work for free. <laughs> like that. That's I, I draw the line at you know certain things. But yeah, I I, I almost got involved with that. All right, they they weren't going to give you like a free flight into space. No, yeah. that would that, that would have been cool. I would have enjoyed that would have been it. worth it. That Joan Abraham, worth. take it hmm. away. Uh, hi, everybody. As uh, some of you know, um, I come out of the fashion industry. I created um, a content uh, content for social media and online merchandising and promotion that really focuses on entertainment. And I got the content cheap enough that retailers can afford to buy it for daily use. And it's all about storytelling. And it, it the, the product itself is the main focus. And we visually manipulate the product so you don't know what it is until the last scene of the uh, vid bit. And there's a story being told with characters over it and they're episodic so that people come back and listen to it. And as far as I know, it's one of the first products in the social content space that focuses more on entertainment than sell and inform. Um, and cheap enough that people can afford to use it every day instead of $50,000 productions that they certainly can't use more than once. Um, I, I was fascinated with the presentation because I'm hoping to go global in years to come. Um, I think this is something that all brands that are lifestyle brands that need image and um, promotion can use. And right now I'm in the process of raising money, working with a, um, uh, a, a investment um, accelerator group and learning so much. It's fascinating, absolutely fascinating. And Michael has been a great help in helping me network to people I need. Wonderful. And uh, if you want to put, everybody should put their LinkedIn in the uh, in the chat. Um, uh, Joan, you might also want to put the link to the VidBits uh, portfolio. I have a quick question since we have 36 seconds left. If each of the, the, the video sort of has an abstract that um, turns into the product itself, I assume that's just one or a few of the videos because it's a whole series, right? So right. you do this it's one product a day. Yeah. It's oh, so one product different, product different products. Every day is a different product. Okay, so so have, the client like, has to have a, a, a large portfolio of, of offerings. Right. Okay. Right. And, and they need about 7 million. They need to gross about 7 million a month to re afford our um, base, our, our lower prices, which is a 12 month commitment. So we have them price related to commitment. One month, six months, twelve months, and it's like 
How much was it again? Uh, well, it's 18,000 for 10 stories for one month. And then it goes down to uh, 10,000 a month for uh, 10 stories if you buy the full year. Right. So there's a graduating scale so that if people just want to buy one month, they can get it and try it. But obviously the focus is on getting people to buy uh, over an experience, extended period of time. But I feel very confident about them really improving sales and engagement. And the test that we did, it was very successful. But so maybe, got, maybe Jeff Stryles could write a, a case study about that test that you did. He, <laughs> he's, he's next. Go ahead, Jeff. Jeff, are Thanks, you Michael. Uh, yeah. yeah, I certainly could write a case study about that or most anything else, because uh, that's what I do. I'm the case study guy. Uh, and actually, Matthew, you and I should talk. I also wrote a book that came out on December 1st last year. And whereas you used case studies, I wrote the book on case studies. So um, we might have some conversations that would be beneficial. Uh, I'd like to see what you're doing to market your book. Um, actually just met with an audio professional out in Orange, California, and he actually specializes in helping authors to turn their books into audio books. So it uh, might be a good uh, connection and introduction to make for you. I'm actually gonna be working with him to turn my book into an audio book. Uh, first part of this year, and then uh, potentially looking at uh, creating a new product line of audio case studies to go along with the video and written case studies this year. So that's something new, uh, potentially for the new year. So yeah, that's it. I'm in Chicago. I'm the case studies guy. Uh, video case studies, written case studies, the book on case studies, case studies. Case studies, case studies, case studies. I should really go to uh, Robert Weiss next, but he's not next on the list. It's Alex Acker. Hey guys. <clears throat> hey, I'm Alex. Uh, not only am I an uh, owner of a new Tesla, but I'm currently <laughs> surrounded by guitars, which I've been playing since I was eight years old. Um, but I am president of Adventure House, a 10 person video marketing agency in business for over 10 years and virtual since 2019. Did you know that 93% of brands want customers using some sort of video content? We create video and animated content for brands to utilize primarily on social that drives leads and new customers. So specifically on LinkedIn, which we all pretty much are glued to, we create short video and motion graphics content that grabs attention for new marketing campaigns, product launches, explainers that showcase a process, simplify a process, or show how something works, tell stories at hyper events, we also run campaigns on LinkedIn uh, and create content um, that use video to get eyeballs and clicks, which have generated our clients hundreds of leads. And right now we're running a special promo up until February 1st of 20% off your first project, which could provide a lot of value to you or to any one of your clients. The example I use is spend a million dollars, get 200,000 off. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll put a link uh, in the chat to the page with more information and the, the promo on how to get started. Thank you for your time. Absolutely. Thank you. And I know uh, Alex started uh, with a more generalist uh, agency, uh, design and et cetera, and uh, became a, a true expert in the video and motion graphics space. Uh, and so we decided to focus on that and has been doing wonderful stuff ever since. So thank you for joining us. Good luck with your new Tesla. Uh, yeah. I'm very interested in talking to you. Cool. You guys should you guys should connect. Yeah. Um, yeah. Certainly, Joan has a has a unique spin on on video content um, that uh, might be of use to your clients. Moving on, Greg Markowitz here in New Jersey. Yep. Uh, good morning, everybody. Glad to see everybody after the holidays. Happy to be back. I know I had to miss a couple of these meetings uh, during the holidays, so I'm happy to be back. Uh, Greg Markowitz, I work for an agency called Breakthrough Digital, a uh, fully remote company founded in 2017. Um, so, you know, uh, there's a few other marketing agencies out there. I'm not sure you're aware. It's a little bit of a saturated industry, but some of our differentiators are uh, we have a philosophy here that we make $1 work like 10. We, we pride ourselves on helping that small business. I don't care if you're the barber shop on Main Street um, or 
we do work with some larger projects. We work with a lot of colleges and universities. We work with a lot of uh, large contractors. I just added a very large roofer to my portfolio uh, two days before Christmas. So I thought that was kind of good to get a deal in right before the holidays kicked. Um, we work with a lot of our a large IT attorneys. You name it, everything we do is custom. Uh, we don't have any set pricing. We don't have any, you know, gold package, silver package. It's not a, you know, one size fits all. Everything we do is customly ta tailored to what the business's goals are. Um, some of the services we specifically offer are SEM, social media advertising, programmatic display, uh, big on, you know, YouTube, um, you know, anything with online video, connected TV, you name it, we do it if it's not web design or SEO, uh, essentially in the digital realm. So, you know, I'll give a little time back. Greg Markowitz, I'd love to do a one-to-one -one with everybody here. So you said it's except SEO and web design? Correct. Okay. We do partner with a lot of those agencies though. So yeah. I do work with a lot of uh, website designers or SEO agencies and we can partner on projects. Well, there's certainly uh, Mark Harry who does SEO here in this group. Um, and of course we do, we do web development. Um, yeah. Moving on, Rajiv, who was an avatar for a little while there. I'm not sure if he still is. Yeah, yeah I was uh, building my new chair that just kind of got delivered because I was, I was having issues with the earlier chair. Anyway, I digress. So not great to meet you all. Happy New Year. Um, so what do I do? Founders and CEOs contact me after character assassination on Eyewitness News and Reddit. The bad press is absolutely strangling them. It is killing them. It is making life a living hell. Their kids come back from school and complain that the other kids are making fun of them because they found out that the dad was up to something. And uh, the mom comes back and says that people at the grocery store and the checkout counter are looking at her funny. And life is just crazy. So my superpower is knowing how to deal with these crazy sensitive situations and getting rid of the bad. Yes, you're right. You heard it right. We delete bad press, we delete scandal, and we delete bad reviews from Google, social, and the internet at large. And why do I do this? I do this because, as maybe you know this, I don't know, but there's a lot of misinformation out there. And that is a wrong that needs to be righted, in my opinion. And that's the reason why I do what I do. And uh, my ask uh, from the group is to meet with trusted advisors, which all, all of you guys are, that's why I'm here. Uh, because any business that comes from you, you get paid, I get paid, the client gets taken care of, and it's a win-win-win situation. Everyone's happy because, well, everyone likes getting paid, right? Got your attention, right? Okay, cool. So that's what I do. I'll put my details in the chat, and I look forward to connecting with some of the people that I have, I'm not yet acquainted with or haven't met recently. I'll leave it there, Michael. Sounds good. Do you have you gotten a call from George Santos yet? Oh uh, no! <laughs> Who's he's that? The, he's the congressman who was uh, has a completely <laughs> fabricated background. Yeah, liar, liar, I, I think that liar. he needs a team. I I think he needs a team. Yeah, <laughs> it would need to be like three companies worth of. Books. Yeah, yeah, you probably don't want to take liar that pants on fire. Exactly. All right, Victor Lee, take it away. Hi, Michael. Thanks a lot. Uh, great to see everybody. Uh, this is a terrific way to start up the new year. Hi, Mark. And uh, so what I do is I connect people and opportunities to create transactions where everybody benefits. So, you know, I look for interesting business situations and often I'll reach out and say, oh, I know somebody who needs, you know, what, what they offer. I, but, you know, my favorite part is when people reach out to me and they need help and they say, hey, Victor, you know, you know, we, we have this problem. And in that case, you know, my business model is three words. It's, oh, I know somebody. Well, if you count O, oh, then I know somebody is four words. Um, so for example, I have a meeting tomorrow with Mike uh, with Michael uh, and a, a friend of mine who's built sort of this interesting new video platform. It's kind of like Slack meets Zoom meets a whole bunch of other stuff. And he says to me the other day, hey, I need development help. So I know, I know somebody. So, and it's, and it's Michael. 
Um, so I'm really you know, looking for interesting situations, really unusual things. Um, it could, uh, you know, cause there are uh, obviously are a lot of, you know, commodity type services out there. So I'm really looking for things that are a little bit, you know, different or offbeat. So for example, I have a company that gets very involved in scent marketing. So we're looking for hospitality situations. Uh, we're looking for medical dental clinics. So I've made some introductions there. So any place that either wants to brand itself with scent or, you know, just wants to make the place smell better. So for example, yeah, hotels do this a lot. So for example, like if you're used to staying at a Four Seasons and if you, you know, switch one day to a, a Hilton, you might, it might seem off to you and you might not even recognize, but the scent is different in different hotel chains. So that's one of the things that we do. Um, and a friend of mine, and then I try to expand the universe. So a friend of mine uh, down in Texas, my college roommate, introduced us to a burger chain down there. You know, it's called Whataburger. I'd never heard of it, but they have 900 locations in the Southwest. And so, you know, we set up one meeting and the CEO agreed to a test. So that's the kind of thing we do is, you know, we go in at the high levels, leverage everybody's connections and try to get stuff done. We make the introduction and then we're on to our next deal. So in order to market what we're doing, uh, my friend Rajiv over there and I have started a podcast. So actually started is not the right word. We started it a year ago uh, in February. We've done over 35 episodes. We've had the benefit of, you know, Michael was also on, uh, was a guest, an early guest on the podcast. Jeff was a recent guest. And so thanks to the, uh, thanks to the, the, you know, the podcast and the guests and everything, we are ranked in the Spotify's top 10% of podcasts. Uh, our, our, yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, I agree with Rajiv. Um, you know, our, our best episode uh, got over 700 visitors. And that was because it was, a, it was a corporate client and they put their PR firm behind it. You know, we've also had like Boston University's business school. We had people there and some others. So the podcast has been a lot of fun. Um, I think Rajiv and I have both enjoyed it, but it's also a great marketing vehicle. Oops, am I out of time? Yeah, yeah you can wrap it up. <laughs> okay, sorry. So we're using it to kind of, you know, pr promote our networking methodology. And, we, you know, we're pitching workshops, group coaching sessions, and all kinds of things for people who need to become better networkers. So thanks a lot, everybody. You know, look, look forward to connecting with everybody whom I don't already know. Thanks. Yeah, I look forward to our meeting tomorrow with Charles. All right, Keith Reynolds. From Colorado now, right? Yeah. Yeah, I had a really amazing Christmas out here, um, which I'll tell you later. Anyways, um, I'm Keith Reynolds. I'm a fractional CMO, um, and I help companies develop their thought leadership programs around what's called a content hub. Turn your website into a much more integrated part of your sales uh, and stakeholder communications. Um, I use a variety of research and SEO to help develop themes, uh, look at competition and set a strategy. And then the content hub, one of the main feeders is a podcast. Uh, I have my own. I've been working with companies and, and, uh, and building my network of people who can uh, support podcast. Um, the goal is to get the executives to do as little work as possible, uh, but to maximize their outreach, as you have said, um, Victor, you know, it's a great marketing tool. Um, and then I was just chatting with Rob uh, and we were going back and forth on LinkedIn. There's also a series of things you can do with your podcast that really increase your exposure. It's not about being, uh, uh, congratulations on being in the top 10%. But it's really about helping you get leads, referrals, and public speaking opportunities. Um, and, and so with that, you know, that's a handshake kind of relationship that executives can have. So it's, it's a really great way to distribute your thought leadership uh, and, and make connections and drive them right into your CRM. Um, I wanted to just say, my, the last thing is I'm working on a campaign. Anyone that would like to take on a white paper, I've got a first draft. Um, one of my mentors is Stan Phelps, who's written the Pink Goldfish um, series of books. Uh, the first one, Pink Goldfish, was about a, a uh, new customer is a lot more expensive than retaining and making a current customer happy. He said to me, Keith, I've you know, been tracking you, and it no occurred to me, what you're really proposing is the chief content marketing officer role. And I was 
I Googled it and that did not exist. And so the white paper tries to differentiate a chief marketing officer, which has a very broad mandate, and a chief content officer, which tends to be involved in the production and maybe distribution of content, but it's really about the voice and being more like an editor. And, and so the book that I wrote a few years ago has seven things that if you focus on, you will be running your business like a media company with this, the metric of sales instead of an advertisement is a, a new lead. You know the value of a lead. You can visit, build a, a marketing model off of your, your waterfall, your sales waterfall. And, and attribute that to the cost of your media to see if you're making money with your go-to-market program. So the chief content marketing officer has that responsibility uh, much more towards customer results than a chief content officer who's talking about messaging or a chief marketing officer. Anyways, if you'd like to see my white paper, I'd love feedback. And Thank you. Uh, you're cutting in and out, so you might want to check your, uh, your uh, bandwidth. Um, but we got most of it. I mean, we got 99% of it, but it was dropping a little bit. Um, thank you, Robert. Video, 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 Weiss. That's it. Um, you stole my thunder there. So, <clears throat> as Michael was saying, video, 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 video. Actually, today has been 12 years. Uh, I, was, I, I incorporated 12 years ago that I started doing video, 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 video without any video, video, video background at all, except like shooting my kids. So uh, fast forward today, we've done over 1200 videos across every single business objective. And I'm gonna share um, a little uh, kind of a case study um, uh, in terms of a, one of the services, uh, one of the myths about video is that it's all about the cameras and equipment. Alex, you can attest to this. It's not. It's huge professional services at play. And what I'm going to share with you now is just really quickly go through this. Um, this we, we this is a, a location that we use for a, uh, one of our latest uh, videos. And this is what it looks like or looked like or looks like now if you went there. Um, I'm just going to walk through it so you can see kind of the whole space. Another couple seconds. And what I'm going to do now is show you two quick videos of what it looked like after we got done set dressing it and bringing all the actors and putting up all the lights and all the. Oh. So this is that same space. Even to the detail of the, there's not wine in the glasses, but there's like cranberry juice in there. But all those little details we put in, we rigged a whole bunch of lights up, sound is all over, and that's what we did with the space. And then here's another one, this is some guy you might know. Bro, really happy. Let's do it one more time. And... Little behind the scenes with the camera. So I share that with you um, just to give you just a, a little taste of some of the things that the services, the professional services of a video production company does because that was a lot of coordination to do. That was a lot of planning. That was a lot of experience coming to the table. And while that was pretty complex, even when we go into an office, uh, we have to do a lot of different things in terms of set dressing, in terms of making changes to the rooms and putting the cameras where they are to actually make it look nice. You know, we all we all like the videos that we like for a reason is because there was, you know, professional skill sets in there. And that's part of what we do. So that's it. Very cool. How much of your work is sort of uh, not live, but uh, um, as opposed to post animation, it sounds like a lot of it is is video of real people in upgraded spaces or, or real places. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, most of the stuff we do. So our, our, our client, my when I when I work, it's at the client location. 
Okay. So that could be a law firm, a manufacturing facility, you know, location like this that we totally set up. Um, that's the majority. We do some motion graphics and animation, like explainer videos and such, but that's a smaller percentage. Most of the stuff we do is, you know, going on site and, and getting people on camera because that's kind of what we're doing right now. Like we're all on, we're all, even though we're on Zoom, we're still talking to each other and explaining things. And that's where we think like the really the big from a B2B sales standpoint is um, you can start off with an explainer video like, you know, Alex does or I do, I do, but also what's the next step. And then you, you need to get that human engagement like in the loop at some point. Uh, um, and video kind of supports that. Very cool. And you'll tell us more about the awards next time off your right shoulder. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mark Harry. Hello, everyone. Mark Harry from uh, Salt Lake City. Uh, my company is called SEO Game. Search Engine Optimization is the game. Uh, some people like to call it SEO Games with an S at the end. And I always say, that's not me. I don't play games with people's livelihoods. So been in business since 1996. What I do is I offer white label SEO, which simply just means I'm under the umbrella of a digital marketer, uh, their label, and I make them look good. My goal is to make them a lot of money. Uh, the purpose is, is to have fun along the way. And I don't think you're having fun unless you're making a lot of money. So it's just a circular rhetorical. Uh, uh, I, I solve problems. Um, the one thing that I've always wondered is about white label SEO. So I started it about 20 years ago, the white label portion of my business. And I and no one was really doing it, but now everyone is. I'm getting the emails now saying, hey, we are a white label provider. We're a digital marketer. And I get all those emails and I, I started doing the math. If there's 50 states in the union. There's probably going to be 10 really good white label digital marketers in every state. So that's about 500 SEO companies that offer white label and, and I've got competition, right? And not, not to include all the other nations, uh, but what makes my service a little bit different, I'm a one percenter out of everybody who offers white label. And that, that is I offer 30 day trials called no rank, no pay. It's performance based. And uh, the performance based model works really great. If uh, you are trying to get a test drive of a website to get number one on the first page of Google, and you don't want to take the risk as a digital marketer. Uh, you use my services to kick the tires. It's a, you know, or kick it to the curb kind of approach. Uh, the, uh, the goal that I have in 2023 is to continue to provide case studies. Um, we have, uh, you know, so many case studies at SEO game that when a customer always asks, a potential customer, what case studies you get? I say, well, what industry? If they're a lawyer doing law marketing, I can provide about seven of them right there on the spot, live, live case studies. I can just do it in Zoom and then in five minutes, I can show them five law case studies. Uh, so I always think those are a little bit more powerful than giving old numbers that you know you don't really mean anything. Live case studies are, are, are fun. So if you want to meet with me and learn about your industry or want to have a case study, I'd love to chat. And, and that's about all I have to say. Thank you so much. And we are down to the last two minutes. I didn't forget anybody. Did I? Everybody got a chance besides myself. Uh, Matthew, um, you got the first 15. Uh, so we'll take, leave it at that. Um, I'll give myself two and a half minutes. Um, my name is Michael Bendit. Um, my core business is uh, a company called Software Development Resources. So I run this network. I'm looking to expand it, of course. Uh, I think it benefits everyone. Uh, my best leads are, in fact, digital marketing agencies that may build websites, but they don't always have the full complement of resources in-house to deliver on the you know, wide range of, of projects that might come their way. Uh, yes, a lot of websites are built on WordPress. We certainly do a lot of WordPress work, uh, but there's also many other platforms out there, e-commerce platforms like Shopify and Magento, obviously mobiles and other entirely different platform. 
And if you don't have the skills to deliver, you don't have the experience to deliver on those platforms, you need to partner with somebody. And so I represent a dozen teams. Um, they got a pretty broad range of skills. Um, most of the time, about 85% of the time, uh, I set myself up so I can say, yeah, we got that skill set uh, and I'm able to deliver it at an affordable price. Um, the best model in terms of onshore versus offshore for most of my clients is what I refer to as dual shore, meaning that some of the team is here in the US, but most of the developers are offshore. So I've got a number of teams that have that dual shore model set up. And it seems to work really well because the client doesn't have to deal with the offshore directly, but they get most of the benefit of the cost savings. Um, I'm looking forward to, uh, to speaking with Charles. Victor and I uh, are speaking with Charles tomorrow, a contact of his. Uh, that seems to be a custom application. Uh, we do a fair amount of work uh, with custom applications for startups or small companies. Uh, that's about 40% of our work. 60%, I would say, is in the marketing world, websites, e-commerce sites, mobile applications. Uh, so we're happy to uh, talk to marketers, marketing agencies, but also anybody who wants to build a, a, a custom application or needs a, a team to take over from maybe a freelancer. Uh, who is not quite uh, pulling their weight, or they've might have just outgrown. Um, so that's that's my pitch. Right on two and a half. I'll switch back to uh, to the gallery mode. Um, thank you all for sticking out and listening to everybody, and um, you know, getting to know one another. That's what it's all about. Definitely make some one on one um, meetups, uh, you know, appointments because that's where you really get to know what people do uh, and get to learn how you can help each other out. Um, happy New Year and uh, enjoy uh, enjoy the rest of uh, the week. And we'll see you again on Tuesday. Don't forget to download the chat. Before That's this right. Goes away. Yeah. Open up, uh, open up uh, chat and then click on the on the three dots. First thing is save chat. You'll get everybody's information.